So we're going to get this started. Talk about homecoming special. Today's next performer was with Snap Judgment from day one. He's a poet, a teacher, a man with a heart as big as a Michigan lake. <laughs> Please put your hands together for Mr. Josh Healy. My grandmother was a sweet little old lady who baked the best chocolate chip cookies ever, who stood four foot 11 in heels, <laughs> and who at one time was the highest ranking woman in the American Communist Party. It's true, it's true, my grandmother Dorothy Ray Healy was the head of the Communist Party in Los Angeles from 1945 to 1968, all throughout the 1950s, which, from what I've heard, was an awesome time to be a communist in America. <laughs> Joe McCarthy, that dude loved my grandma. He loved her so much, he sent her to jail three times. And all three times, she appealed her case to the Supreme Court and won her freedom. Now, now when I was born, Grandma moved from LA to DC to help raise me and my brother. We called her Comrade Granny. <laughs> and when I was 10 years old, Comrade Granny took me to a protest that helped shape my own politics to this day. There was a strike out in the Maryland suburbs. So grandma and I went out to join the picket line. Nothing new so far, just another day in the struggle. But when we get to the factory, I look up at the sign over the gates and I can't believe it. I don't wanna believe it. There, staring at me from the sign above the factory gates were these huge images of red licorice and purple lollipops and every dark, delicious flavor of chocolate possible. I said, Grandma, are we protesting a candy factory? <laughs> and she said, no, Joshi, we're protesting the candy factory owners who aren't giving their workers a living wage. I can't believe this. I can't believe this. I mean, I'm 10 years old. I'm standing in front of the real life version of Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. And you're telling me I can't go inside and swim in the chocolate waterfall? Taste the lollipop trees? Now that is an injustice. But here we are outside the gates and there's about a hundred people in the picket line and grandma and I join in and we start marching in a circle and we're chanting for justice. But the truth is, I'm not thinking about workers' rights or living wages. All I can think about is that sign and how I can get inside for one second and have one taste of that sweet, sugary goodness. So I go up to grandma and I ask in my nicest little 10-year-old grandson voice possible, I say, grandma, do you think I can go inside and maybe they'll give me a little candy? <laughs> but comrade granny don't play that. <laughs> she says, Joshi, I am very disappointed in you. We've taught you in this family, you do not cross picket lines. <laughs> you, you don't wanna be a scab, do you? <laughs> a scab. A scab. Now, you know, a scab is technically just the replacement worker a company brings in during a strike. But to true activists like my grandmother, a scab is the worst thing in the world that you could call someone. A traitor to the working class. An Uncle Tom in a room full of Black Panthers. When grandma asked me if I'm gonna be a scab, I say, no, no, 
no, no, no, no. I'll be good, Grandma. I promise. And she says, good, good. But if you are getting a little hungry, why don't you just go get something from the hot dog stand down the block? So I start walking, and I'm walking, and I'm about halfway down the block when all of a sudden, I see it. There, on the back side of the factory, is an open window. <laughs> no way. And I look around, and I don't see grandma, and I don't see anyone, so technically, I wouldn't be crossing the picket line, right? I'd be going around it. So I jump over the little factory fence. I race across the parking lot. I scramble up a dumpster. And one step at a time, I climb inside the open window. I'm in. I'm inside the candy factory. And it's not exactly what I expected. There's no chocolate waterfalls. There's no lollipop trees. But there are assembly lines and conveyor belts. And wait, oh, a huge, massive crate filled with thousands, millions of dark, freshly packaged chocolates. And so, I tiptoe my way over to the crate. And right as I'm about to put my hand in and grab a piece, I hear behind me, hey you! And I turn around, but it's no security guard. It's a kid, a little kid with big freckles, even younger than me. And he says, hey you, this is awesome! <laughs> I'm Bobby, let's get some candy. And so he takes a piece from the crate and starts eating it. So I take a piece from the crate and I start eating it. And then another, and then another, and then another. And before you know it, I've got chocolate all over my hands and chocolate all over my face and chocolate on the back of my neck. And I'm like, I look at him and I'm like, Bobby, this is amazing. How did you get in? And Bobby's like, you see that guy over there working that big machine? That's my dad. And I nearly choke on my chocolate. Bobby's dad is a scab? Does that make Bobby a scab? <laughs> and since I'm in here eating this piece, what does that make me? I look over and I say, I gotta go, man. Thanks for the candy, Bobby. And I tiptoe back to the window and I climb out. I scramble down the dumpster. I cut across the parking lot. I jump over the little factory fence and run back out to the front. And when I reach the front, the strikers, the strikers aren't marching in a circle anymore. They're just standing in front of the factory gate arms crossed. The factory whistle blows, it's shift change, and a row of cars filled with scabs starts trying to make its way right through the picket line. The strikers are pushing back, pushing against their windows, shouting at them to go home. And four big cops are shoving the strikers back, moving them with their batons. And grandma, grandma is right up there at the front of the picket with the strikers marching, shouting solidarity forever, solidarity forever. I look over, I see Bobby sitting on the curb, looking around for his dad, trying not to cry. And here I am, right in the middle. I've got grandma on one side, Bobby on the other, a pocket full of chocolate burning its way through my jeans. What should I do? And five minutes later, things start to calm down. Some of the strikers, some of the scabs made their way through. Some of them decided it wasn't worth it and go home. Grandma and I, we start making our way back to our car. I look on the other side of the street, see Bobby 
walking with his dad. And I look up at my grandma and I'm nervous. But I ask her, I say, Grandma, if you're the son of a scab, does that make you a scab? And she says, no, Joshi, it doesn't. Just like being the son of an activist doesn't make you an activist. Everyone has to decide for themselves. Why do you ask? And I take a deep breath and I reach into my pocket. I pull it out and I show her. And when I do, I can see the anger and the disappointment all over her face. And she says, give me that. And I do, and I hang my head. But when I look up again, I see something different. I see my grandma, my first real comrade, look at me and see her 10-year-old grandson. And she says, well, Joshi, there's really only one thing we can do at this historical moment. And she takes the candy and she breaks it in half. She gives half to me and pops the other half in her mouth. And she says, as Marx would say, <laughs> it's always better to share the wealth. <laughs>